in case anybody didn't get the title of that, it was comedy tonight. From a funny thing happened on the way to the forum, Zero, Mostel, and Chorus, and the original cast recording. Steve, what did you say to me a minute ago? This was the first time you'd heard it in seven years? Yes, it's, uh... I seldom play my own works. I just like to have them there so I can play them when I want to. There was a story behind that particular song I, that I think uh, would come as a pleasant and interesting surprise to a lot of people. Oh, well, it was... Um, that number was not written or uh, put into the show till just before we opened in New York. We had um, opened our out-of-town tour in uh, New Haven and then gone to mm. Washington where the show was an unqualified disaster. Really? It lost $100,000 on the road. That's an unqualified is, disaster. And the show, which, uh, the book for which had been written by Bert Shevelov and Larry Gelbart, we'd worked on for four years. This was not the kind of romp it seems. It was a, a very serious attempt at a celebration of 2,000 years of comedy and of comedy techniques. Mm -hmm. And uh, I happen to think the book is... Uh, minor masterpieces, one of the most intricately written and put together, as well as stylish, uh, uh, verbally mm -hmm. stylish books ever written. And, uh, in fact, I think it's one of the two best in the history of the American theater, the other being Gypsy. Uh, I was about to ask you what you thought the other one was. Well, it was Gypsy. And uh, we were aware that that the audience wasn't taking it the way we intended them to take it. They didn't think it was funny enough and they didn't seem to be carried along in the evening and Bert and Larry and I had a suspicion that what was wrong was the opening number. The opening number at that time during the out-of-town tour was a very charming song called Love is in the Air. It was a soft shoe vaudeville number performed originally by Davy Burns mm -hmm. and uh, the Three Proteans and then taken over by Zero and the Three Proteans and it never worked. That is to say the audience liked it but it put them in the wrong frame of mind. They thought then that what they were going to see was a rather charming, light-hearted evening, mm -hmm. instead of which we uh, then proceeded to give them a, a very bawdy, um, violent, low comedy, very intricate. And we had a t hard time persuading George Abbott, who was directing it, to let us try another opening number, because George was very fond of Lovers in the Air, as indeed we all were. And so most of the time on the road was spent uh, trying to fix up the other portions of the, of the play, uh, both from performance and from writing points of view. But finally, we were in such trouble down in Washington still uh, that uh, we asked Jerry Robbins to come in and give us the benefit of his, his advice and perhaps work on the show. And the first thing he said to George and Hal Prince, who was producing it, and... Uh, uh, the authors was that the opening number must be changed mm -hmm. and the opening number must be a number that would let the audience know exactly what was go what they were in for for the rest of the evening and George was persuaded by Jerry so over dinner one night Jerry and I planned out this opening number I had actually written a form of comedy tonight earlier not mm -hmm. the, either the same lyrics or the same music or anything like that but uh, certainly similar subject matter uh, meaning a cavalcade of what comedy means. And Jerry then staged it in the last week in Washington. I wrote it over a weekend. He staged it in a week, and considering how dazzlingly it was staged, it's remarkable in itself. We put it into the first preview in New York, and immediately the show was a smash, which illustrates a terrifying axiom in putting on musical plays, which is that the first five minutes are probably the most important. And if you don't do them right, uh, you're in a lot of trouble, and if you do them right, you can really coast for an hour or maybe more on uh, much less effective material. Mm -hmm. That's a fascinating point, and I don't think many people really are aware of it. It's almost a subliminal point in terms of the fact that you get your attention riveted in the beginning, and, I, and you're right. It, you, you do uh, get carried along with it. West Side is a very good example of that, too. The opening of West Side Story is uh, a, a, a seven-minute danced prologue, which is very violent in content, and the audience knows from that exactly what kind of evening they're going to be in for. And I uh, was witness many times to people storming out of the theater in anger when they had come in to see what they thought was a, a musical, in quotes, and they realized in the first five minutes they were going to have a terrible time, and they were able to save a whole evening, and maybe even demand their money back. 
Well, now, listen, that uh, axiom didn't uh, take place really, I don't think, anyway, unless you can um, disprove it, by one of your most charming scores, Anyone Can Whistle. And um, uh, having found out about uh, the opening number in, in a funny thing happened on the way to the forum, what happened with Anyone Can Whistle? Well, Anyone Can Whistle was a show very close to my heart, and it got blasted to pieces by the two leading critics in uh, New York, and we only ran for nine performances, which was very sad, because it was a very ambitious show that Arthur Lawrence and I had worked on for quite a while, and very serious, but we could never solve the opening. It's a very, again, a very intricate show, and... The first five minutes of that left the audience in a state of confusion, and we were aware of it when we were trying out in Philadelphia, and we wrote four different openings, and the fourth one we did was much the best of the four, and it's the one we opened with in New York, but it wasn't good enough. Mm -hmm. And uh, it took an it was a three-act form, and it took the audience the entire first act to get over the intimidation of the first five minutes. They were so confused by the first five minutes that I think they were uncomfortable until they had their first intermission in a smoke and knew that we weren't trying to uh, intimidate them, mm -hmm. which, and uh, they enjoyed the second and third acts a lot, but the damage had been done. I'm awfully glad, in spite of its brief run, however, that it was given a recording, a full-length original cast recording. All credit for that goes to Goddard Lieberson, who's pr president of Columbia Records, and who did not have to record the show because the contract, when Columbia agreed to mm -hmm. uh, record it as is a standard procedure, I hasten to add for those listening who may not know, was that the show has to run, I think, 21 performances, mm -hmm. uh, and if it doesn't, then the recording company company is free of their contract mm -hmm. and they do not have to spend the thirty or forty thousand dollars to record the album of what is obviously a flop goddard however championed the show from the very first day i played in the score and though we only ran nine performances uh closed on a saturday night the next uh, day sunday uh he had columbia record it which uh i will be eternally grateful to him for because the one terror of writing a major piece uh, and having it done as a show is that if it is not recorded, there is no permanent record of it, no, no pun intended. No, no, of course not. And uh, I will uh, not only be grateful uh, verbally forever to Goddard for that, but I dedicated the vocal score to him because uh, without his enthusiasm for the show, there would be no record of it. Well, I think it's time that we heard a bit of that because, as I said a moment ago, it also happens to be a great favorite of mine. Here is Lee Remick from the original cast recording of Anyone Can Whistle with the song, Anyone Can Whistle. Anyone Can Whistle, Lee Remick from the original cast recording. That is such a beautiful song. Why, thank you, Scott. You're very welcome, Steve. It is absolutely marvelous. Now, perhaps with the recording around, there's a chance that the show will get revived. The problem with reviving that show, we've had a number of inquiries about reviving it off-Broadway, but because it deals with the madness of crowds, you simply cannot do it on a postage stamp stage with a cast of eight. Mm -hmm. It really needs 30 people because the major incident in it concerns the mingling of two lines of people, and you can't do that with four. You have to do that with 16, mm -hmm. 20 people. So I don't think it can ever be done off-Broadway. It is done occasionally in schools and colleges. And, uh, which is why Chapel made the vocal score available. But I think the chances of its getting revived is, are slim unless it mm -hmm. is done in some kind of repertory thing, like, you know, Lincoln Center or um, someplace in Los mm -hmm. Angeles or one of those things. And I think the chances of, it, of its getting revived on Broadway are slight because musicals are just too expensive and yeah. people don't like to take chances on flops. However, there's always a first time. There's always a first time. Now, listen. Listening to these two songs of yours, uh, I find it very hard to realize that you're a pupil of Milton Babbitt's. Now, Milton Babbitt is somebody I love very much, and is a friend of both of ours, but he, it does not sound like a student of Milton Babbitt. Well, when I came to Milton, which was, uh, I got a prize at, at Williams. Uh, they give something there which is a boon to creative uh, writers. Um, it's called the Hutchinson Prize, and mm -hmm. it either goes to... Um, prose or poetry writing or to painting or to music. Music actually has the preference. And it's just a money grant, uh, which can be renewed at the end of the of one year. It was, yeah, I, I suppose it's still in existence, I, I don't know, but it was a, a handsome sum of money. It was $3,000 
for one year, and you can do anything with the money you want. You can buy a car if you want with it, but the chances of it's getting renewed for the second year are slight unless you use it well. Anyway, a um, man who taught me music up there recommended Milton as somebody I should go to because I didn't want to go to a music school. Mm -hmm. I'm not interested very much in the history of music, and all I wanted was theory and composition. I had majored in music at Williams, and I wanted to continue. And so, having won the Hutchinson Prize, I went to Milton and found that though in those days he wasn't yet on to electronic music, he was mm -hmm. just writing atonal, he believed that, uh, he, he did not believe in teaching atonal mm -hmm. music. He believed that uh, the only way you arrive at atonal music is by finding that the resources of tonal music just don't satisfy your. Mm -hmm requirements. That's how he arrived at it. So he only taught tonal music. And at that time, he had a couple of classes at Princeton and about five private students. And he had room for me. So I studied with him for three years. And it was all tonal uh, composition and theory. And it was analysis uh, not of Verez, but of Beethoven and Mozart. Plus the fact that Milton happens to love songwriting. He is uh, a repository of knowledge, not only on classical music, but on show music, too. As a matter of fact, he's the only man I ever met whose favorite songwriters are De Silver, Brown, and Henderson. <laughs> and he is perfectly willing to hold forth in the most scholarly and articulate manner on how they're better than anybody else who's ever written. <laughs> but he likes all of them. We would spend the first hour just sometimes actually analyzing mm -hmm. songs. I remember a marvelous day, uh, one of the lessons where uh, we spent a Oh, half an hour analyzing all the things you are, which is a remarkable song to analyze because it illustrates a lot of neat points about the sustaining mm -hmm. of, of music over a period of time. And so, <clears throat> contrary to the formidable face he presents to the world of a man surrounded by electronic monsters mm -hmm. and way ahead of not only his time but everybody else, he really can uh, uh, adjust to anything, and uh, I never learned a thing about atonal music from him, only about tonal. That's fascinating. Well, now, uh, I've been privileged to have many guests at this microphone during the course of this program, but uh, yours is certainly one of the most unusual programs that anyone has ever picked. And um, I want to turn now, if you would uh, be so kind as to tell us a little bit about it, to a piece of Benjamin Britten's that you have selected for this evening, uh, St. Nicholas. Now, I must confess to you, it's a piece that I don't know anything about. Well, it's a kind of cantata to be performed in churches. It's a long piece. It's, uh, oh, 40 minutes or so. And uh, the part of it that I particularly like is the second section. It's uh, scored for orchestra and organ and children's choir and uh, boy soprano and tenor and chorus. And it's a major work. And I can't remember where I first heard it, but I'll tell you one interesting story about it. It's always been a favorite thing of mine. I like to play it for people because it is obscure enough so that many music lovers don't know it. And one of the people I played it for was Lenny Bernstein. Uh, it was, I think, right after we had finished West Side Story, and he came up to the house, and I was playing him some of the things that are on this program, as a matter of fact, things that, uh, with all the music he's heard and knows, he hadn't heard. Mm -hmm. And I know he particularly likes Britain, and so, since he hadn't heard this, I played it for him. And he had a very uh, uh, straight-faced, rather unenthusiastic reaction to it, seemingly, after I'd finished it. He said, yes, that's nice, or something like that. And about three months later, he introduced it on his children's program. <laughs> it's a marvelous piece, and marvelous for a children's program. And it showed that he didn't, he, 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 he didn't want, what, the audience to miss such a marvelous piece of music, even though it's just a little isolated, very light piece. Mm -hmm. Well, just um, uh, to uh, refresh your recollection and to introduce this piece perhaps to uh, some of the people listening to us tonight, here is part two of Benjamin Britten's St. Nicholas. Before, before you yes, go into that, can I interrupt? <clears throat> please? I'd like to explain to people who haven't heard it because the lyrics are very difficult to understand in this recording. This section is called St. Nicholas Growing Up, and it's for the children's 
choir and their diction is not terribly good. And it's composed in a series of tiny little sections, each of which is, uh, describes the activities of St. Nicholas as a child in his bath, playing on the grass, neighbors coming around, and at the very end of each little section, you'll hear St. Nicholas himself, who interestingly enough is sung by David Hemmings, now a movie star. Mm, uh, you'll hear him say, God be glorified or God be sanctified. But if you remember that, uh, as you're listening to it, that the lyrics that you can understand are all about his uh, activities as a child, and then the final section is, and so St. Nicholas grew up. That's essentially what it says before the very last entrance. Very good. Peter Pierce, tenor, David Hemmings, Benjamin Britten conducting the Oldborough Festival Choir and Orchestra, St. Nicholas. Benjamin Britten, St. Nicholas. I'll be back with my guest Stephen Sondheim. In one moment, we'll pause now for some announcements. This is the radio station of the New York Times. When you buy a stereo... Stephen Sondheim, that is a fascinating piece. I've never heard it before in my life. Well, I must say, I would like to be in a church and not have heard it and have that last section occur where they describe... St. Nicholas growing up, and then have the tenor stand up and replace that boy soprano. I just think that's one of the most dramatic conceits I've ever heard. And that's, of course, something that Britain is brilliant at, which is why he writes such good operas. He has a real sense of theater, which is also why I knew it would appeal to Lenny. <laughs> you were right. He does have a real sense of, of, of theater. I mean, the Peter Grimes is one of the masterpieces, to me, of modern operatic literature. You and me both. And um, I just i am very glad the Metropolitan at least keeps it in the repertoire. Yes, and against, uh, there, there are always audiences walking out on it right and left, and they still keep it in, which is... Uh, tribute to the management or whoever is responsible for that sort of thing. Right. I found it shattering. I had never actually seen the opera until I presented it last year. And uh, I uh, didn't know what I would do at the end of the first act. I was so moved. And I'm not an opera fan. I'm uh, <laughs> very anti-opera, as a matter of fact. I find most of it dreadful and prefer listening to it on records. And uh, But when you get somebody like Britton, who has a sense of what the theater's about, mm -hmm as well as, a, as being a first-rate composer, mm -hmm. then it's thrilling. Well, now, uh, another piece that you picked this evening is, again, something that is strange to me, and it's a Brazilian folk song, Bambalele, I think it is correctly pronounced. Mm -hmm. um, what, um, what is this? Well, uh, this is sung by a lady in Delphi, Houston, who had quite a vogue in early 40s, and her specialty was South American folk songs. She got a, a group of um, songs together and had them arranged for her and piano by some leading young South American composers. This one was arranged by a man named Gallet, or Gallet, about whom I know very little, but uh, those in the know say that he was quite well known down there. And uh, though I am given to hyperbole, uh, my favorite statement about this is that it's the best song ever written. It's a tiny little song, and its uh, delicacy is, is part of its uh, charm. And the piano accompaniment is very subtle and has to be listened to very carefully. The more you hear it, though, the more there is in this piece. And I spent a long time tracking down the sheet music of this just for my own pleasure. Uh, it's very hard to play on the piano, too, and curiously enough, the actual printed copy and what goes on in this recording are uh, slightly different, but different enough in enough respect, so I wonder uh, why it was changed. And yet the basic accompaniment figure, which is just terrific, uh, is right there in the sheet music. Okay, well, I think this is the perfect moment to listen to it. Elsie Houston, soprano, and the Brazilian folk song, Bambalele. I think that's a beautiful song, but if I may say so, I don't think your hyperbole necessarily is totally accurate. Well, it's, uh, it's, uh, I mean, there is no such thing, I guess, as a best. Uh, it's, I suppose, more accurate to say it's my favorite song. Mm. Uh, it's, it's how, how marvelously economical it is, as well as, I think, being one of the prettiest melodic ideas I ever heard, and of course mm -hmm. her performance does that too. It's also the inventiveness of the accompaniment, 
which the more you listen to it, the more invaluable well, you realize it is. That I get sense in, in listening to it for the first time. I just don't know of a more perfect song than that. And I have got many favorites uh, among songs, um, uh, particularly of, you know, um, contemporary American yeah. songs, meaning 20th century, and I actually know very little of, of uh, the history of art song. I'm very, very little of Schubert's songs. I've listened to them, but I don't know them. Mm -hmm. This one just it struck you. me, that's mm -hmm. all. It's an emotional reaction. Well, I think it's, and after all, that's one of the things that is marvelous to me about about people who care about music the way you do, that the emotions have not been taken out of what is being done. So much of that is the happening these days in the contemporary scene. Oh, sure. You said earlier that you're not crazy about opera, but you did pick a, an, an opera selection to be played this evening. So if you're not crazy about opera, I would like to know why, and uh, you can say it in any way you like, about uh, Barber's, um, Samuel Barber's Vanessa. Well, I've been to very few operas in my life because the f uh, most of the time I go, I just don't enjoy myself enough. But I have an enormous record collection, and I like to collect the music of contemporary composers whose work I admire. I would never have known the music of Peter Grimes by just going into an opera house. It's just that because I liked so much of his orchestral music, mm -hmm. I bought the operas and listened to them. And I like a lot of Barber's music, so I bought Vanessa, mm -hmm. and I listened to it, and I found it, for the most part, rather gray and uninteresting, and I wasn't particularly taken by it until I suddenly heard this quintet, which is the climax of the play. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was one of the most ravishing pieces of music I ever heard. And it's always made me want to see the opera, which I've never had a chance to do. Uh, I, uh, I don't know enough about... Um, so-called classical operas to know how it stacks up um, against other quintets. All I know is that this seems to me to capture not only the emotion of the moment, because I then read the libretto carefully, but to be, again, as in Bombalili, so cleverly and delicately and economically com composed, at the same time it's dealing with a very large romantic emotion mm -hmm. that I find it thrilling. Well, we're going to hear it right now. This is the quintet from Samuel Barber's Vanessa, Eleanor Stieber, Rosalind Elias, Regina Resnick, Nikolai Geda, and Giorgio Tozzi. Dimitri Metropolis conducts the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra. Quintet from Samuel Barber's Vanessa. It's marvelous to hear that again. I, w I would like to have seen it very much. I, uh, as I say, the rest of the opera strikes me as being kind of traditional and not terribly interesting, although it's always full of gorgeous little musical mm. moments because Barber is a really nice romantic composer as far as I'm concerned. But that's a number that must stage itself. You yeah. said you'd seen it and it was yeah. gorgeously staged. It and was. My claim to you would be it would be very hard to stage that badly. <laughs> <laughs> you may be right. Now, we're going to play your last selection tonight, and then I want to ask you a little bit before we have to go about uh, what you have in the future. But I must say, you picked a lovely one for a close from the uh, Vaults Noble Sentimental of Ravel. This, I take it, is something that has, uh, is a favorite of yours as well. Oh, well, Ravel is a favorite composer of mine. Mm -hmm. And, in fact, I did my senior thesis at Williams on the left-hand piano concerto, which is my favorite of Ravel's pieces and followed closely by the mm -hmm. most noble of cinema. I really think he never wrote a bad note. And um, the seventh waltz, which is the, the one here, is also something I happen to like playing on the piano besides everything else. But this is, of course, the orchestral version, and I think it's one of the most romantic pieces I ever heard. I agree with you, and just to remind everybody, here is the waltz number seven of the waltz noble sentimental, Ernest Ansemé conducting l'Orchestre la Suisse Romande. All right, there you are, waltz noble sentimental. I, just, I must say, the program you picked tonight has a kind of gentle lilt to it. Yes, always. and listening to it now, I should have picked something acerbic or vigorous. I'm afraid I can give the impression of being a bohemian poet of the early 20s with a Morris <laughs> Ascot. Because uh, I like a lot of uh, uh, harsh music and vigorous music, and but I uh, hadn't realized until I'd listened to this whole program. 
This is right. I think you'll find that it is not quite as uh, as uh, 1920s bohemian as you might imagine. Steve Sondheim, what are you up to at the moment? Well, I'm finishing a piece, a uh, piece, a show. Uh, I was taught to say piece by Leonard Bernstein, as a matter of fact. He hates to refer to things as shows, they're pieces. Um, called The Girls Upstairs, which is an original with a book by uh, James Goldman, who wrote Line and Winter. Oh, yes, indeed. And we've been on it and off it and on it uh, for three years, off it simply because there were other things occupying our attention or had to for money-earning purposes. Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, I hope, the f I, well, I know, the first Chekhovian musical. It's not based on a Chekhov Chekhovian piece or a piece by Chekhov, but it is very Chekhovian in feel, and it's very romantic. It's like some of the pieces on this program. In fact, I intend fully to steal as much of the, the uh, Barber's Quintet as I possibly can, because it ends, as indeed Vanessa does, with a quartet of people regretfully saying goodbye, although uh, uh, different tone, but uh, I, uh, I'm i going to uh, use whatever I can from that's his point of view towards that. That's good. That's professional plagiarism oh, of the right kind. You believe in that a little. Oh, absolutely. I think uh, the only thing is that you have to steal from good people. Mm -hmm. And when I say steal, of course, I do not mean specific melodic ideas, but approaches and, and techniques and mm -hmm. things like that. How did you get started in the lyric writing field, since obviously your main interest is composing? I was uh, brought up during my teens through various family vicissitudes by Oscar Hammerstein. And he just pushed me into it, really. He urged me to write for school. So I wrote a show at, sc at school, at uh, prep school, George School in uh, Pennsylvania. And then he would start criticizing my lyrics, and uh, I learned from him, got interested in them, and he kept urging me to, and so I went on doing it. Matter of fact, he laid out a program for me. He said, first, uh, do an adaptation of a good play. So I did one, this was at college, mm -hmm. of Beggar on Horseback. And then he said, do one of not so good a play, so that you have to do more work on it. And I did one of High Tour. Then he said, do a non-dramatic work, and I did, of all things, Mary Poppins. And then he said, then you can do an original. And then I spent two years doing an original about what I had learned about life at the age of 21. Well, Steve Sondheim, thank you for coming down here tonight. Please continue to give us all the pleasure that your music and lyrics have done ever since you have been a part of the American musical scene. And now this is the last of our current series of Conversations in Music. I've enjoyed being with you each week and the privilege of presenting a wide variety of people for whom music plays a major part of their lives. This is Kyla Chapin. Good night. <laughs>